Good afternoon again. My name is C.B. Mamrill, and on behalf of the PHSR National Coordinating Center at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health, I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar as part of the PHSR Research and Progress Series on Quality, Cost, and Value of Public Health Services. Today's webinar will focus on Go With the Flow, Understanding the Temporal Dynamics of the HIV Treatment Cascade in the United States. Before we move forward, I'd just like to remind everyone that today's presentation and speaker bios are available for download if you refer or see the re top right corner of the screen and the resource box. So today we have with us a Yale School of Public Health lineup and um, both our presenter and both our commentators of whom I will be uh, introducing after the presentation are all from the Yale School of Public Health. And so it is our pleasure to introduce first our presenter, Greg Gonzalez, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Epidemiology of Microbial Diseases at the Yale School of Public Health. Greg is also a research scholar in law and lecturer in law at the Yale Law School. He is the co-director of the Yale Global Health Justice Partnership, an initiative of Yale's law and public health schools focusing on teaching, research, and policy at the interface of health medicine, law, and human rights. Greg has been an AIDS activist for more than 20 years. He has worked domestically on AIDS drug development and clinical and basic research policy, focusing his attention on National Institutes of Health, Food and Drug Administration, the pharmaceutical industry, and internationally on access to medicines and diagnostics in resource-poor settings. Greg formerly held fellowships with the Open Society Foundations, and the Harvard Medical School Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. His doctoral studies at Yale applies quantitative methods drawn from different disciplines, particularly operations research, to improve the efficiency and outcomes of programs for HIV and infectious diseases. Greg is a 2014 recipient of the PHSS Award, Pre-Doctoral and Postdoctoral Scholars in Public Health Delivery. So it's our pleasure we introduce you, Greg Gonzalez, and Greg, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So thanks, everybody, for joining the call today. I wanted to talk to you uh, about the temporal dynamics of the HIV treatment cascade, but first wanted to thank Professors Ed Kaplan, David Pelkiel, and my advisor, Paul Cleary, at the Yale School of Public Health and School of Management, who have been instrumental in helping me think through all this work. Um, so. First, what I wanted to talk to you about is the sort of lay of the land in terms of the public health and healthcare imperatives around the HIV epidemic in the US. Right now, only one out of four HIV positive people in our country are successfully making it through the HIV care continuum and getting the full benefits of treatment. Um, last week, a study came out sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, which says that every person with HIV, regardless of CD4 count, should be offered antiretroviral therapy. Um, but as I just mentioned, only 25% of people are actually getting on the drugs and successfully suppressing their virus. Now, this is not just a matter of clinical care for individual patients. It's a prevention priority for public health. Uh, each year, 9 out of 10 new HIV infections are transmitted by individuals who are not in care. Um, to put it uh, in, in the converse, for every 100 people on successful antiretroviral therapy, um, less than one new infection occurs. So it's vital that we get people through the continuum of care in the United States, both for the clinical perspective uh, of individual patients and their doctors, but also for public health professionals and people who care about the epidemic as a whole. So the picture I'm showing you here now is the HIV treatment cascade. Um, it's been compiled by the CDC, and it's, uh, there are lots of iterations of this, this simple graph. Um, and just to walk you through it very quickly, um, of the 1.1 million Americans living with HIV, about 82% of them are diagnosed. Um, as you move from diagnosis to linkage to care, only 60% of Americans living with HIV are linked to care. That means they've seen a doctor. They've uh, at least had one doctor's appointment. Um, there's a steep drop off uh, in terms of people who are retained in care. That means they come in for a subsequent appointment after their original one. Um, about a third are prescribed the antiretroviral therapies that we've just spoken about in, in the previous two slides. And out of those, one quarter of them are virally suppressed. 
Um, there are many iterations of this treatment cascade slide, depending on different demographic groups, um, different geographical regions of the United States. Uh, but this is a fairly representative one of the data over the past couple of years. So what does the HIV treatment cascade tell us? Um, um, in other words, if you wanted to get more people through the cascade and virally suppressed, what would you do? Uh, and as we thought of this, we thought the current way that treatment cascade is uh, uh, conceptualized doesn't give us enough information. Um, we need additional detail. We need additional depth and, and, and breadth in our descriptions of what's going on at the continuum of care. Um, and in particular, what we thought were important to have to improve outcomes was to know how long it takes to get an individual to get through each stage of the cascade, as I, as I mentioned to you, uh, diagnosed, linked to care, retained in care, uh, offered therapy, and being successfully virally suppressed. And we also need to know the probability of dropping out in each stage. These both have uh, major implications for how we deliver clinical care and address public health needs in this country. And what we are suggesting is that operations research offers a new way to think about the treatment cascade. So here's a little introduction to Turing theory and Little's law. Um, Turing theory is a, is a uh, component uh, a section of operations research, and it's simply used to model the wait in lines. The picture here of people waiting online at the Apple store in New Haven, but um, Little's law and Turing theory has been used to model anything from supply chains uh, the, 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 the allocation of hospital beds, um, the manufacturing systems uh, in, in, in industrial processes, and even in, in things like the US military. Um, and basically, Little's law um, is a simple one. It basically says the average number of items in a system, L, is equal to the average arrival rate, how many people are coming in, and the average wait time in the system. Um, and for people who work in public health, uh, it's often easier to conceptualize this in terms of the epidemiological um, claiming of, of the same, the same uh, formula, which is the prevalence equals incidence times duration. And that's sort of Little's Law in a nutshell and Little's Law for epidemiologists. Now, we decided to apply queuing theory to a model of the HIV treatment cascade. And, um, as we were talking about before, there are, there are several um, stages in the queuing model. Uh, people moving from undiagnosed state to a diagnosed state, from being diagnosed, linked to care, uh, linked to care to retained in care, virally suppressed, and um, uh, where you'd probably like to stay, um, and uh, in fortunate situations, moving on to being virally unsuppressed or dead. And basically, you can see arrows leading from one, from from the start of the cascade where people are undiagnosed all the way to the end, and then arrows pointing up which, which represent uh, people dropping out. And that's sort of the general sort of basic crude architecture of the queuing model in the cascade. Um, on this slide, I'm just talking, I'd like to describe to you sort of the probabilistic description of the cascade in its most general form. And remember I just said Little's Law was uh, uh, equivalent to prevalence equals incidence uh, times duration. And if you look at the box at the, the bottom of this slide, you can see the expected number of people in any given stage is, is a function of the, the number of people coming in, um, which is in this, you see the product term and, and lambda. Um, and then you see the arrow pointing up in which um, we have the product term plus a, a term P sub I, which is probability of dropout. Um, and then you, you can see uh, towards the right, they, uh, coming out of the slide, the number of people the number of people who are going on from the, that first stage to the next one. And basically, you'd iterate this along. So, you know, coming in on the first stage, you'd have lambda, which um, would be the incidence rate of disease in the United States. Let's say 50,000 people um, going out in the in the first stage would be lambda times p1 um, going on. Uh, out of the, that first stage would be lambda times 1 minus P1. And then basically, as you can see in these formulas, you just iterate that down the line until you get to the end of the cascade. Um, and this is sort of the general probabilistic model of, of, of the cascade. Um, when we look at it in uh, for other probabilistic distributions, it'll be much more specific. 
So, so what are what are we going to do with this cascade model? Um, so, in terms of the available public health data, because we wanted to do this study based on data that was publicly available, so that state health departments, city health departments could use this, the CDC could use it, um, and you know there is some direct information that the CDC collects through state health departments um, on diagnoses. So we know when somebody has a nucleic acid diagnostic test. Um, we also know when somebody is virally suppressed because the CDC to the state health departments also collects uh, quantitative viral load measures from state health departments. But in terms of some of the other stages for the treatment cascade, we're having to deal with proxy measures. Um, and in, uh, in specific cases, in terms of linkage to care, what we're using is at least one viral load or C4 test reported to the, to the CDC to stand in for being linked to care. And greater than, greater than or equal to two viral load or CD4 tests and in for retention in care. Now, this is important. One is because um, state and local health departments collect this information as well as the CDC. And these proxy measures have been accepted in the literature as stand-ins uh, for both linkage to care and retention in care in, in, in over a dozen different scientific papers. So we think this is a reasonable way to approach the data we needed for our study to populate our queuing model. Um, we worked with Irene Hall and her colleagues at CDC to, to, to get the data for our study. And what Irene Hall and her team put together for us was a group of individuals uh, who were at least 13 years of age and diagnosed with HIV in 2009. Remember, we're talking about a temporal description of the cascade. So we're starting in 2009 with people diagnosed. And then we're following them with their CD4 and viral load tests for the diagnosis date to the end of December 2012. And the center date for the study is, is New Year's Eve 2012. So basically, we have individuals here with, uh, equal, uh, with greater than or equal to three years of follow-up time. Now, this isn't nationally representative data. This is CDC data from 2009 to 2012 from California, um, not the whole state, right? LA and San Francisco only, uh, Washington, DC, Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, Michigan, and you can see the rest of the states uh, and cities listed on the on the slide here in front of you. Um, so we have a, a data set from CDC, which is which has a small proportion of the states uh, and other jurisdictions in the U.S. where where people with HIV live in our country. So what we did is to fit the data. We we estimate we. To estimate the expected time in it and the dropout probability from each stage, we, what did we, we did, we used, we computed three survival models. Um, we basically used an exponential model where progression from into the next stage and the dropout rate are constant over time. A Weibull model where the hazard rate for progression to the next stage are dropping out uh, are proportional to each other and the dropout probabilities don't depend on time spent in each stage and the hyper-exponential where we are assuming there's two classes of patients, uh, slow and fast progressors, and each class has its own constant progression rate and the same constant dropout rate. Um, and basically, we, fit it, we fitted survival models uh, to each of these uh, probability distributions and then looked at log, log likelihood values to assess degree of fit. Uh, and I have additional detail on how we did this um, in terms of how we uh, set up survival formulas and things like that if people would like to see them, they can see me afterwards. Um, but this is what our preliminary results indicate. And there's a lot of numbers on the slide, and so I'll, I'll walk through them slowly. Um, so let's talk about what the slide shows you. On the top, you see we have the first column, which is the stage, and we have diagnosed uh, individuals before they get their first CD4 viral load test, so they haven't gotten to a doctor. Um, the next stage in blue is linked to care, um, which, is, which means they have had one CD4 test or viral load test, but it's before their second CD4 or viral load test. And then in pink, we have retained in care, which is, uh, means they've gone through one, or, one uh, two or more viral load or CD4 tests, but it's before they have an undetectable viral load test. Um, and when we fit our model using uh, uh, the exponential and Weibull and a hyper-exponential, distributions. We have um, a description of time and stage in months um, and dropout fractions. And in terms of diagnosis before their first CD4 of our load test, uh, under the exponential distribution, we have about three months uh, in that stage. 
Under the Weibull, it's about uh, similarly about 3.11 months, and then the hyper exponential is about 4.8, closer to five months. Um, I think what you can look below uh, under the 95% confidence intervals is to uh, give, your, give, give ourselves a sort of wide range of what we think might be happening here, that we think the time in this state is probably between 2.9 months uh, at the lowest and probably up at 5.2 months up at the highest. Um, when we look at dropout fraction, uh, we see about 8% dropping out in the exponential model, about 7.8 in the y bull about 6.6, 6.7 in the hyper-exponential. Again, uh, if you take a conservative union of confidence intervals by looking at the, the lower bound and the 95% confidence intervals, all three of them, and the upper bound, um, you, you see the range we're sort of thinking about is um, credible in, in all three of the models that we put together. Uh, when we just looked at it in terms of log likelihood, the hyper-exponential uh, was the best fit for this part of uh, the cascade. Link to care, um, if you look at time and stage, we see the exponential is about 3.65 months. The, the Weibull is very, very close to it. And the hyper-exponential is 5.2 months. Um, again, the sort of lower bound in terms of the confidence intervals is about 3.5 months, with the upper bound about uh, 5.88 months. Um, Similarly, the dropout fraction, we have about 5.7% for the exponential, about 5.6 for the Weibull, and about 3.7% uh, for the hyper-exponential. Um, again, the hyper-exponential distribution worked out best in terms of our log likelihood values. Um, the big difference here in the results is what happens in retained in care. And this is where, you, where you've had your first viral load test, you've had your second C4 viral load test, um, you're retaining care, but before you have undetectable viral load on antiretroviral therapy. And you can see that the time in this stage is, is, is much longer than in the previous two stages. Um, we see the estimated, uh, the uh, expected time in this state as nine months in the, under, in the exponential, about uh, 14 and a half months in the Weibull, and about 13 and a half in the hyper exponential. Um, and you can see the ranges in the confidence intervals below. Um, and the dropout is also larger in this uh, portion of the cascade, with about 17% in the exponential, um, about 9% in the Weibull, and about 10% uh, in the hyper-exponential. Uh, in this case, the Weibull distribution is the one that works out the best. Um, we are waiting for data from uh, the uh, NA Accord study, which is a large uh, collection of uh, AIDS cohort studies in the US to sort of uh, run the data for our last stage, which would be uh, suppressed uh, on antiretroviral therapy. So these are the first three stages of the cascade. So we haven't sort of figured out uh, what we're going to do um, in terms of reporting the, the entire sort of set of uh, all these probability distributions in the final analysis until we see what the last one looks like. But this gives you a taste of sort of the range of values we've seen in all three of our, our models. Um, if you remember the queuing cascade we started with, which is uh, a cross-sectional and descriptive model, that's what we get out of the current CD4 data. Um, what we wanted to do is just, um, it, it doesn't validate our model from a statistical perspective, but we just wanted to get a reality check. Does, does what we've done look at all like what you see in a treatment cascade uh, in the descriptive cross-sectional sense? And if we start with the presumption that 82% of people are diagnosed in the, in the US and we take the data from our curing model and our curing analysis, we see um, the following proportions linked to care and retained in care. You know, anywhere between 68.6 and 63.8 uh, in the linked to care uh, column, second column there, um, and then about 45% uh, to 54% retained in care, uh, which is a reasonable approximation of the cross-sectional version you see of the cascade uh, uh, reported out by CDC and uh, individual state and state health departments, uh, other AIDS researchers around the country. Um, so what does this mean? What this means to us is that we can indeed construct a temporal model of the ATB treatment cascade using available data. Um, most of the discussions of the treatment cascade in the U.S. are these static versions where you see uh, a slice of life, a, a slice of what's happening in the U.S. at one point in time. Um, it doesn't tell you how people move through the cascade uh, in any given year and what their risk is of dropping out of the entire system. Um, so we think it's, a, it's the first sort of uh, soon-to-be comprehensive model of the, the entire treatment cascade from a temporal sense. Um, 
I think there are pretty strong implications here for for what to do in terms of the public health response and the healthcare response, and that speeding progress through and reducing the probability of dropout from each state in the cascade are two complementary strategies. Um, I asked you early on in this presentation, what would you do based on the data you saw uh, in the cross-sectional cross model of the cascade? Um, when we look at a temporal model of the cascade, it says you probably have to do two different things. One is get people through the system uh, more quickly, um, and the other one is to keep them in the system and not from dropping out. And they may be indeed uh, different operational tasks. With the first one uh, involving system efficiency, overall patient management, and perhaps the latter one around dropout involving one-on-one -on -one interactions with the patient. So we think this queuing analysis actually offers a, a new way of thinking about the cascade, but also gives us um, maybe a little bit more nuance in terms of how we can respond um, as public health and healthcare professionals in addressing the patient needs and the public health needs in getting people to the end of the cascade where everybody in this country is, is successfully virally suppressed. Um, what's important to us, too, is that we're able to use public health data um, from CDC and state health departments to improve healthcare outcomes for, for patients in the healthcare sector. So it bridges those two worlds um, that many of us on this call are, uh, care about. Um, we think we'll probably have this research um, finished up by sometime later this summer when we get the data from the NA, uh, the NA Accord studies. Um, we're hoping to publish our results both uh, in terms of the, the research we've done, probably in the Journal of AIDS or another specific uh, journal related to HIV, but we also would like to use, we've done this all in Excel, um, which for some people seems uh, uh, strange, but we think it's actually a great way to make this tool available to state health departments and city health departments so they could use their own CD4 and viral load data to populate um, uh, our spreadsheet and get a temporal version of the cascade for themselves to use on a local or state level. Uh, and hopefully we'll work with Connecticut uh, and other states in the New England region as part of the New England Implementation Science uh, Working Group to, to um, implement some of the work we've done in this study in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And before they give their commentaries, we'd first like to introduce our two commentators today. We are pleased to have with us Dr. Paul Cleary, Dean of the Yale School of Public Health, and Leanna M. R. Lauder, Professor of Public Health at the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Cleary is the Principal Investigator and Director of the Yale Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS. Uh, he has been actively involved in research focused on persons infected with HIV. Paul has had a component of the HIV costs and services utilization study and has conducted a national evaluation of a quality improvement program in the Ryan White funded HIV clinics. Paul has been a member of the Institute of Medicine since 1994 and served as chair of two IOM committees related to HIV AIDS in 2002 and 2010. Dr. Cleary is also PI of a Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems Project funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to develop consumer surveys on health plans and services. He is a chair of the National Advisory Committee for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Investigator Awards in Health Policy Research Program and also is widely published and has served in editorial capacities for several publications including the Milbank Quarterly, Journal of Health and Social Behavior, the Handbook of Social Studies in Health and Medicine, and Advanced Handbook of Methods in Evidence-Based Healthcare. Paul's commentary will be followed by Elaine O'Keefe, who is Executive Director of the Yale Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS, and she serves as also the Yale School of Public Health Executive Director of the Office of Public Health Practice. She's also a lecturer in Epidemiology and Chronic Diseases, and as Executive Director of the Center, she provides ongoing financial and administrative leadership of the center and works with the leadership team to implement strategic direction in support of the center's mission. Uh, Elaine is also a member of the Connecticut Public Health Practice-Based Research Network. Previously, Elaine was health director for Stratford, Connecticut for 14 years and also served as the AIDS division director for the city of New Haven. She is a founding member of the New Haven's Mayor's Task Force on AIDS and the Women's AIDS Coalition. Um, Elaine has also contributed to groundbreaking HIV AIDS policy and was a key figure in the movement to authorize access to clean needles 
clean needles in Connecticut and the nation. So I turn it over to you, Paul, first. Go ahead. You uh, hear me okay? Yes, we do. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks very much, CB, for that nice introduction. And thank you to you and Glenn and all the staff at the uh, PHHSR National Coordinating Center for this great program. Um, I, uh, I thought Greg did a terrific job summarizing his project. I just wanted to emphasize a couple issues uh, that he made. One is uh, why I consider this such an important PHSSR study and to elaborate a little on what Greg said about how it can be used. Um, I've been involved in, as you indicated, HIV research for more than 30 years. And uh, it's, I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of work over that period has been focused on individual behavior. In fact, our center, which is supported by NIMH, is called a behavioral center, uh, meaning uh, the majority of work that's traditionally been done in these centers is focused on individual behavior. Uh, but if you think about the cascade that Greg presented so well, you immediately recognize that there's a wide range of individual, um, interpersonal, social, and structural factors. And for those of you who don't work with this jargon, structural factors really means what I would call systems factors. So it's really the ultimate system study of preventing uh, HIV. And I think Greg very nicely made the case why this is public health, why it is prevention. In fact, the we, we call the paradigm is treatment as prevention. So really screening people, getting their viral load suppressed is a key part of the national AIDS strategy uh, for prevention. Um, we're actually, Elaine and I are taking a break right now. We're running a uh, New England symposium uh, on an implementation science network. There's about 120 people here. And we've been looking at slides on the uh, cascade all morning. And everyone agrees we have to improve progression through the cascade. The problem is, as Greg highlighted, we don't have enough information to do what everyone in this room we're at today has to do. That is allocate scarce resources um, to various interventions. Um, what Greg mentioned, but may not be obvious to you, if you have you know, $1,000, $100,000, a $1 million dollars makes a huge difference in terms of the impact on the proportion of people who are virally suppressed where you put it. And until we get models of this where we know who's coming into treatment, who's dropping out of treatment, and who's progressing to viral suppression and so on, we won't know where those monies or efforts are best invested. So we have to start getting a model like this, and then we can start estimating where to allocate resources, how to change those, really the two key parameters, the dropout and progression. You want to reduce the dropout. You want to increase the progression. Um, until we know that, we won't be able to do that. And uh, Greg's final comment was key. This will be a tool that will be of incredible benefit. And I should emphasize, uh, we keep emphasizing to Greg that we need to focus on the core model and keep it simple, but the elaborations are incredibly important. So for example, Greg said 25% of people are virally suppressed. Some CDC data just came out estimating 28%. There's also a study we just saw this morning showing among youth it's only 6%. So even within an area, let's say uh, New Haven, Connecticut, whether you allocate resource, the cascade may be very, very different for older individuals, younger individuals, individuals in different communities, and so on. And as I mentioned, we're in a symposium from people all over New England. Um, the challenges in a place like Boston, uh, which is represented here, are very, very different, we think, than, for example, we're doing studies in nine other cities of between 100 and 200,000 individuals. And everyone knows this, and everyone's trying to grapple with it, but until we have some really sophisticated tools where we can start making good database decisions about where to allocate resources, we're going to be stymied on the prevention. So uh, we should spend time. Uh, Elaine has some comments. Uh, she's worked in the field for many, many years. 
uh, people may want to ask questions, but I just want to emphasize that even though this seems um, theoretical and you may not understand the lambdas and so on, the practical significance to public health on something like this is really enormous, and we're uh, incredibly excited. People have done this um, to a certain extent in diseases like tuberculosis and so on, and it's been very, very powerful. And we think there's incredible, uh, not just theoretical significance, but practical significance to uh, this study. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Elaine. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I also, this is Elaine O'Keefe, I, I want to really uh, extend my thanks and appreciation to the center and to CB and his colleagues for continuing to host these webinars. I've been a beneficiary and have learned a great deal about research studies um, in PHSSR in various stages of development, and I was really thrilled when Greg um, received funding to support his dissertation work, uh, and I want to thank um, Greg also for inviting me to be part of this, the discussion today, but I will try to make comments um, that are not redundant with uh, those already made by Paul, uh, starting by saying that, you know, when the cascade first appeared, everybody was very excited about the potential for this framework to really help us identify gaps in services and also priorities and where we, we should be putting our resources. And particularly, as you know, in the beginning, it was much more focused on care. Uh, and people with HIV, and then increasingly began to, you know, be more balanced with both the, the value of of the cascade because of the treatment as prevention paradigm, to look at both benefits for for care um, and prevention. And I think, you know, it certainly has been utilized in that way, uh, particularly at the national level, and states do their own cascade analysis. But it is not been so easy to access and use at other levels. And I think that's one of the issues, as well as some of the issues with, with, with the type of data that's, that's been available or not available to create the cascade analysis. Um, so I think it's pretty exciting that, and very much in line with the goals of the National HIV AIDS Strategy, that we are using more real data. We're using, I mean, they always reported that we should be using surveillance data, and the 12 city projects tried to do that started to do in other places. And one of the, 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 you know, the added value of this work that Greg is doing with his colleagues is that not just identifying you know, where people are or the percentage of people, proportion of people in different stages of the cascade, but how they're progressing through. And also, I think critically importantly, how, where are people dropping off? And, you know, we have to get beyond, beyond that and look at not just where are they dropping off, but who is dropping off or why are they dropping off. I think there is a potential to use the cascade and that exists in this project to some degree to get more nuanced data that really illuminates the HIV disparities that exist. Uh, and we discussed that just this morning at the symposium that Paul and I are at, that, you know, you can do the cascade for different populations as well, and hopefully that will be happening and there have been efforts to do that, looking specifically at where are black people on the cascade, where are, are gay, bisexual men on the cascade, and so on. So that, I think, is another real great potential of, of this, this work. Um, something else that I wanted to say, though, is that I think one of, the, one of our greatest issues right now is how do we look at the data in a very contextualized and local way. Ultimately, HIV prevention and care happens at the local level. And here at the New England Symposium, we're talking about just that. In fact, you know, the, the cascade has been used a lot by states. It's been used more so in large metropolitan areas. Um, very, it's very rare to find good cascade data in small cities. So uh, we're really excited because at the symposium that we're at now, we have been able to fund through CIRA and the Lifespan Tufts Brown Center for AIDS Research a joint project that's going to look at the cascade in nine, nine very small cities. Um, and so, again, I think this, this work has potential value for working at that level as well. I mean, ultimately, the questions that you raised, Greg, about, you know, what are the fundamental questions? How do we get people through the system? How do we keep them in the system? Um, those are questions. That's the million-dollar question for all of us in the field. And we all know that while the cascade will be helpful to point us in, in, in you know, to really refine our work, there are lots of structural and contextual factors that we have to contend with and we'll have to keep focusing on those as well. 
Um, a lot of the barriers that people face, we may have access to care, we may, may have access to prevention, it may not be acceptable for a variety of reasons. So, I, but to, to end on a real positive note, I, I do see tremendous value in this work and promise, and I'm looking forward to actually seeing the results of the study. So, thank you. Thank you, Lane. Thank you, Paul. And so we're going to open the uh, chat box, I guess, for questions. Uh, feel free to type them in. Uh, we're still trying to, the center, trying to work out something that's more efficient, and sometimes there's a lag uh, when you're typing in, so please uh, bear with us. But also you can uh, email directly the uh, presenter or the commentators uh, if you also have questions that you'd like to um, discuss even after the webinar is over. So um, I guess we can start with some of the questions that are already in the chat box. Uh, there's a question from Lava. And so again, we open the questions to everyone. Uh, I mean, in terms of both the presenter or the commentators are, are welcome to, to answer them uh, accordingly. So Lava asks, how does this cascade model deal with the process of skipping stages? So for example, if someone comes to the health department being already positive for HIV with a significant drop of CD4 counts and needs. Um, so I guess, Greg, you can answer that question, please. So, so people really don't skip stages. So if somebody comes who's already positive for HIV, they've already come to the undiagnosed stage and are in, in, in the second box, so they did get diagnosed somewhere. Um, so what Lava is asking is a very individual question about uh, if I come to a doctor's office, I already know my status, um, I have 100 T cells, and I need, need ARVs. That's sort of an individual question. What, I, what the work here is doing is backing up and saying, um, Suppose we have 100 people who are just like that, um, who are getting stuck in the undiagnosed phase or in the diagnosed phase and not making it onto linkage to care. Um, the, what the, this study will tell you in the aggregate is, is where the bottlenecks are in this, in this uh, quest to get to undetectable viral load. Um, as Elaine and Paula said, you know, looking at just national data is probably um, the least informative in my own mind. I would really like to know how this plays out in terms of men who have sex with men, how it uh, plays out for African American communities, rural versus urban areas, the, the, the New England versus the Southwest. I think we'll see very, very, very different sort of um, scenarios for the Turing model depending on where we do it and among which populations. And I think that gives uh, a better answer to a lot of this question because it, it, that will give us a sense of where do you have to put your money to push people through the system more quickly um, or to keep them in the system um, based on the sort of very, very specific detail that model works in, in, in a local uh, or population-specific way. Hello? I think, I don't know if you saw it, Greg, but um, uh, Brittany Johnson has asked a question. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, have, if you consider, have you considered incorporating some of the information collected from data to care initiatives that are using surveillance data to relink individuals to HIV care? has highlighted some of the limitations of surveillance data as a proxy for HIV treatment adherence may be helpful for further refining these models. Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of things. One is I haven't seen it, so I'm going to have to look at it. But, um, you know, this is not, you know, there are very sort of sophisticated models with, with backdoors to the treatment cascade and different sort of uh, 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 much more complex model of how care works in, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, what we were trying to do here is to do something with available data so it was uh, usable by, by basically anybody who, uh, any health state department that has to report C4 and borrow load data. The proxy measures are, are not great, but they're what we have in terms of surveillance data right now. So you could use this data right now. Um, if we could make, uh, uh, if there's, a broader set of data that had more detail and, and, and more nuance uh, that was uh, widely applicable to all 50 states uh, around the country, that would be great. Um, we're sort of dealing with the data that we have now, not to sort of 
um, make the most specific, complex uh, model uh, that most accurately defines the sort of state of the continuum of care in the United States, but a, a simple tool that people can use to sort of diagnose where the, the bottlenecks are. I, I do think we have to refine this, and I think other people will do it, and there are people who are doing it. Um, but we wanted to just have a, a basic sort of framework so that you could you could sort of look uh, with data you have now to sort of figure out where the problems are at the current moment. And I, and I realize it's not a very um, detailed, complex model. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, although Ms. Johnson raises a really critical issue, and Greg uh, talked about this briefly when he mentioned, you know, the proxy data that you have to use. We haven't talked about this explicitly, but one advantage um, of an approach like this is where one can find good data, um, you know, that where you don't have to use proxy data and you do have proxy data. With this kind of model, uh, you can find out how good your estimates are based on different types of proxy measures or elaborations of proxy measures. So Ms. Johnson's absolutely right. These are really, uh, we don't know how good they are. They're, every, you know, they're reasonable estimates. We think they're the best we can get. There are situations where you can get both the actual data and proxy data, and, and a mo once you have a model like this, uh, you can assess how well you can reproduce um, the, a the actual data with the proxy data, and it'll give us another tool. Um, Anne is saying, will your data be available for others to use in the future? We will put, you know, I, we have to talk to Irene and, and the CDC, but, you know, my, my general feeling is that we will put our Excel spreadsheets up on the web with the data from the CDC. It's all aggregate data. There's no, it's, there's no personal identification possible to the data we have um, so that people can use. If you're, if you're a local state health department, you have the data already to use for this model. Um, you know, the other thing is we could have used the NA Accord cohort data to, to actually look at linkage to care, retention and care, and, um, you know, dismissed with the sort of proxy measures of first and second bar load or CD4 tests. But, you know, the cohort data is, is research material. Um, and, you know, it's very specific to Johns Hopkins or Duke or whoever runs the cohort study. Um, the good thing about the data, the proxy data we have is that it's public data. It's available to every state, or state and city health department. And so um, it's sort of uh, open data that people can use to, to make uh, policy decisions. Um, we could do a, a better cascade probably with, with existing cohort data, but it, it really wouldn't be something that would be usable by other people. Um, is it possible to describe the population that moves to the final stage of barley unsuppressed? Um, the difference between the population that we have from the C so the CDC is giving us data from um, state and local health departments that were described in the presentation, uh, the set of state and city jurisdictions. The data um, from the NA Accord um, to the, that was going to talk about people being virally, virally suppressed um, will be from their cohort studies, which are uh, a dozen or more cohort studies around the U.S. that have been following people longitudinally for many years. Um, Anna is also asking if it's possible to describe the population that moves to the final stage of virally unsuppressed. On that stage, it's, it's basically, basically what we're going to see is that the people lost the follow-up in the cohort studies. So they, they were in the cohort um, and and they're no longer being followed, um, or they're virally unsuppressed, or they're, they're dead. I mean, basically, the, the one thing about this cascade model is you want to move everybody quickly through it, except until you get to the to the, the stage of viral suppression, where you want them to be there indefinitely. Um, and so um, I think we'll have some data from the NA Accord in terms of how many people die and, and, and died in that study and how many people are sort of gone off therapy or, or, or are now virally, uh, have now fulminant viral replication. Um, and we're waiting to see what the data looks like. We're hoping that you know most of the people who go to the NA Accord studies um, end up staying in the box of virally suppressed. This is Elaine. If there are no other questions at the moment, I wanted to pose one to Greg, and that is um, the, you know, that there, there is movement toward more active use of surveillance data, and it's not happening, obviously, around the country, but it would be interesting to see where states are really, really doing that in a very proactive way, what impact that could have on the cascade. 
using the surveillance data as a way to do case management and follow-up. And it's been focused on care, keeping people in. Has, has, that, has that been part of what you've been looking at at all, Greg? Can you say that again? You, it, it... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying that um, you know, there, 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 is, there is a movement to use surveillance data in more active ways so that state health departments would actually have individuals follow up on people who are reported with HIV uh -huh. to, keep, as to keep them in the, in the cascade, and that, that would also factor into the, factor into the cascade in the health system in those states, you would think. Should improve yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, you could also do uh, an analysis like this uh, in in different time periods and see, you know, for instance, um, suppose Connecticut decides that um, we're not getting people to, we're getting them their second viral load test, but it's taking them too long to get uh, successfully viral suppressed and they do an individual-based intervention or a community-based intervention to do this. Um, you know, you can, you can assess that event intervention on an individual level, what it did for individual patients, but you can go back and look at the cascade data and say, as the time from um, retention and care into viral suppression sort of decreased over time for the entire population data set. Um, so I do think it might be a way to use sort of surveillance data in addition to sort of um, intervention data to sort of complement each other. Are there, uh, oh, here's another question. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Paul, first. Oh, no, I'm just going to one of the things uh, that's exciting about this symposium, this network that we've developed, is people from throughout New England are compiling data, trying to use common definitions. So we'll actually be able to compile really a library or a database of information from multiple areas and increasingly, with increasing differentiation. Um, and if you have a tool like this, then we can start analyzing differences among areas that we were talking about. Yeah, no, technical question from Abby about uh, why you thought the hyper -ex exponential survival model might best explain the data. Um, I, I mean, I think the reason we looked at the hyper exponential is because, you know, in sort of real world terms, there are people who actually think of it in terms of um, differential access to healthcare, for instance, people who might get an HIV diagnosis. Um, have health insurance that are linked to care immediately, get their second viral load, and are virally suppressed all within a year. Um, we know from the, the real world data that for populations where healthcare access um, is, is um, not as good, and where you're going to see this sort of quote unquote slow progressors through the cascade. They have problems getting diagnosed, getting linked to care, getting retained in care. Um, so that's why we decided to look at, you know, we looked at the exponential and the, the Weibull, and then we went on to the hyper exponential just to sort of to look at two, two sort of classes of populations um, within a, a, a single model. Uh, we, we could separate the populations and look for a model for each population. We did these three up front, um, you know, largely because they were tractable and we could do it uh, uh, in Excel. But we can, we, we, you know, as we go through the final version of the um, analysis once we get the data from NA Accord. I think we'll look at a, a couple of other probability distributions to see if we can get better results uh, than we have so far. Because I, I do think the question you asked about whether we might be able to uh, fit different survival processes with uh, models for each of the populations is a good thing to look at as well. I don't know if that was uh, a satisfying answer, but you know, we, we've worked through these three ideas uh, first. And you know, I think once we have all the data, we're going to go back and sort of say, think if we can uh, do some uh, additional analyses before we sort of put this all together in the paper. Uh, as we wait for the question, oh, okay, as we wait for a question from David to come out, uh, I guess something related to the, the technical aspect, you did mention something, Greg, about having it on a worksheet for the cascade model uh, and having this uh, piloted at the uh, local health department in Connecticut. Could you speak a little more to that? I mean, just for the no, Excel worksheet, yeah. So, so okay. what we, you know, so what we, we've done the whole model basically on three Excel spreadsheets. So it's, you know, and you know, the, I think there's actually simple to sort of work work your way through. Um, as I was saying to Anne yesterday, what we'd like to do is sort of not only put together a scientific paper for 
for um, publication that talks about some of the the statistical models we looked at on some of the questions that Abby has raised. Um, but to think about if we could put together something that was a public health tool and use use this Excel, Excel spreadsheet that we use for our analysis as something we could share with state health departments. And since we're in Connecticut, um, and, and Loretta Grau and others at Yale are looking at the cascade in Connecticut, um, you know, my idea is perhaps we can sit down and think about how could we figure out a way um, how we could take the spreadsheet that we're using for our research and um, uh, make it useful as a, as a public health tool to people up in Hartford. Um, so, um, and if we could do that, we could do, put out a separate communication that really describes um, how to use this as a, as a practical tool as well as a research tool. So, so just to be clear, Greg, the uh, survival analysis component is, is separate from this Excel worksheet tool, right? Correct? Uh, no, the survival model is all, it's all done. Oh, is it incorporated all, into the worksheet too as well, the Excel worksheet? All, yeah, it's, it, the entire survival model is built into Excel. So, oh, I mean, okay. What we have That's to do is, interesting. Okay. Yeah, and the, you know, all the, the confidence intervals and uh, standard deviations, everything is in the, in, in the two, three Excel sheets. It's, it's um, so if you have your survival data, I mean, if you have your, your data, sent your data from your, from your cohort, from your state, right. you could put it into the, the first three columns of the spreadsheet uh, and then uh, import it into the rest of the document, I think. So, oh, that would um, be a cool tool, Chip. So I guess we can wrap up with one last, if you would like to comment on, they had to comment about the model. You read it on your chat box? Yeah, yes, the, the model with the most parameters will fit the data best. Um, yes, at the, I mean, David's right. Um, you know, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just thinking of it now. Yeah, I mean, we could, we could look at a Markov chain model and parameter for each transition point. You know, this, the, the thing I'd say back to David is that we want to keep this simple. Um, and um, I'll go back and think about you know, his question and see if we can do it in a simple way that, that um, has the virtue of being something that can be used uh, in, in, a, in a practical setting with other people. But I do think he's right. You know, we can, we, we can have more parameters. We're going to fit the data better. Uh, but, you know, maybe, maybe there are other ways to look at this. This is the way we thought was sort of an easy way to do it. It's a queuing model. It's done in industrial processes and other places where uh, people have great familiarity with it. But, you know, market chain model might work just as well. Isn't, it, uh, isn't the Markov model limited in terms of time and state? Oh? Yeah, isn't the Markov model limited to in its ability to model time and states? Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. All right, so uh, with that, we'd just like to remind everyone, for those who still might have questions in mind, that you can either send them directly to our presenter or commentators, or you can also email them to the National Recording Center. We'll be gladly forward this to our presenter too as well. And, and so with that, we, we'd like to thank you, Greg, and thank you, Paul and Elaine, for your time and expertise, and then just for uh, sharing and presenting in this webinar. We really appreciate it, and we thank you for that. And just to remind everyone that uh, all these webinars uh, are, 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 are at the National Coordinating Center, Center website. website, and our next webinar our will be at the National Center. Center. So we thank everyone thank again everyone. for your time this, your time. this afternoon, and um, we hope to see you soon again. Thanks. Thank you.